Hey folks, we're gonna go ahead and, and start up. Um, I hope everyone has had a wonderful uh, time thus far at our conference. Oh, that's wonderful. I'd also like to um, just remind everyone, if you're interested, at 3.30, we are doing the RIT Tiger Tank here, where you're going to see five teams present. Um, but this time period is for our keynote speaker. And I just want to add a, a couple few points, is that it's always a great pleasure for me to introduce the keynote speakers, because our model here at the RIT Entrepreneurs Conference is really to bring in people from the RIT family to bring in trustees and alums that actually have done well with entrepreneurship, technology, design. And the vast majority of the folks we bring in are relatively recent graduates. You know, they've graduated within five or 10 years and it partic particularly resonates with students that say, wow, you know, if I, if I pursue this path, I, I can see this. And we're very appreciative. Now, towards this trend, we have a wonderful keynote speaker in this year's conference. Um, yeah, Ted Zuba is here from us, who graduated in 2006 from the College of Science in computational mathematics. And he co-founded um, Milo.com, which is one of those very unique websites which actually is doing hyper-local shopping. They look locally and they see not only what you can buy locally, but what's actually on the shelves, which is a very technically complex area, hence the computational mathematics. Um, this, uh, this business was sold in 2010 to eBay, and Ted has actually worked at eBay for the last four years, and he serves now as a technical director, but he's also made experimental, experimental projects from eBay's Disruptive Innovation Group, which um, I'm a scholar in this area, and I know of this group, and it's a very interesting place. Um, he lives with his wife um, in San Francisco and his three children, and not only is it, uh, it was a, a very big sacrifice for him to come and, uh, and do this, but he also left all three children with his, with his wife, um, which was a sacrifice, so we, we are appreciative to Ted and his wife for actually letting him come out. This is, a, this is a great thing, but thank you very much for coming, and the floor is now yours. So thank you so much for the invitation to come back um, to speak here at RIT. I've been living in Northern California for almost 10 years now, and I really forgot how cold it was here. Um, <laughs> and I've been, I guess, feeling a bit nostalgic, um, but only really for a Nick Tahoe's plate, which I just found out they closed the one that was close by here. It's, I don't know, unfortunate. Um, well, thank you all for coming here. It's really great to see so many people at RIT interested in entrepreneurship. When I was a student here, you really only heard that word around the College of Business. Um, and I was a pretty big time geek, so that seemed kind of like, I don't know, icky, right? Like that's the, the business stuff. You don't wanna deal with that. Like math, this is where you wanna be, man. Um, to be honest, I still am kind of a geek, uh, but pretty tame by Silicon Valley standards. Um, any CS students in here? Anybody computer science? Yeah, I know a guy who has tattooed on his left arm the like lambda calculus derivation of the fixed point combinator. Like, it, like that's a thing that happens. Um, how many people in here want to start a company someday? Okay, cool. Wow, that's a lot. How many have already started a company? Wow. What are you guys doing here? You got work to do, man. Uh, it's really great seeing all the people in this room, how I think RIT has changed in the last few years since I was a student. Uh, I came here because I knew I wanted to work in applied technology, um, and RIT was really the perfect fit for that at the time. Uh, but I came here and I left here with the same attitude, which is, what are the skills that I need to get the job that I want? Um, and the attitude, I think, is shifting towards what are the skills that I need to build the kind of company I want to? And I think the earlier in life you have that sort of like shift of your frame of mind, the better you're gonna do in industry, whether you start a company or not. Um, I had never really planned to be an entrepreneur, uh, at least when I was in school. But you never really know where the small decisions you make in life are gonna take you. Uh, when I was in high school, myself and three other friends, 
uh, we spent a summer coding an electronic medical record system. Uh, this was for one of the other guy's mother who was a physician. Uh, and she had all these paper records that she wanted to bring in the co computer. And this EMR thing was still pretty new at the time. So we spent three months doing this uh, for her. And we ended up open sourcing the software. And every once in a while, I check in on it. It's actually still around. And it's, it's really interesting that having done that so early, it's something that is still in use. And there are people who they make a living off of customizing this thing for other physicians. And in that summer that we did that, I earned a sum total of $1,000 for three months' worth of work. Um, yeah. Even though I didn't really know it at the time, that was really like the start of a career. Uh, and I didn't know I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but that's really where it began. When I came here to RIT, I was not a computer science student, although I probably should have been. Um, I was computational mathematics, which, I mean, I think was better, but that's just my opinion. Um, <laughs> I ended up getting an on-campus job here at the Educational Technology Center, which I think has now been renamed Production Services. Uh, it's, they do like internal web development. And the reason I found that job was because I had this previous experience coding this electronic medical record system. And I was coming in as a freshman, so they knew they were going to get four years out of me. Um, and it's funny. It's, it, I worked in the windowless basement of the library. Um, and the job really consisted of writing event registration forms for stuff like this. And it really made me question my interest in computer programming because it wasn't really so much computer science as it was fixing really annoying browser bugs. Um, my boss, uh, Raman, would come to me with all kinds of bugs. And it was like the most annoying thing to constantly be told that your work is not good enough. Um, but I guess that was a harsh introduction to what it was going to be like in industry. Um, besides, I was paid by the hour, not by the task, so I guess I didn't mind that much. When I was a junior, year, uh, a junior here, I cold applied to an internship at Google. And they called me back because I had this programming experience at RIT. And I spent a summer there as an intern in Mountain View. Uh, my job was to build the Google employee directory search. Uh, I mean, not the most interesting thing in the world, but it was a pretty good internship, I got to say. Um, and after I graduated, I had joined Google full time, even though I like nearly died of senioritis because they sent me my offer in October, and I had to graduate before it was actually final. Um, but even being in Silicon Valley as this like web 2.0 thing was really taking off, um, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know that's what I wanted to be. But two of my close friends from RIT who were in software engineering, they knew that they wanted to come out to Silicon Valley to start a company. Like, that's what they wanted to do. And I was just kind of hanging out at Google getting fat. Um, so when they came out, they asked me if I wanted to join. And I said, sure, because I was, like I said, getting fat and a little bored. Our plan was to build a news recommendation system, uh, totally automated machine learning, artificial intelligence. It was going to be great. Uh, the idea was we'd use the semantic text analysis and machine learning to learn the type of things that you'd be interested in reading about. And then we would show you stories that were on that topic, right? Like, sounds great, kind of. Um, for a math guy, it was awesome because we had like vector space projections and this machine learning algorithm. It was really juicy. Uh, and we'd raised $30,000 from one angel investor to try to get this off the ground. Um, and we spent a year, like the three of us working in an apartment, like really intensely on this project, which I thought was really cool. We spent a year on it, and we launched it straight into total failure. It was a disaster. Um, the company was called PressFlip at the time. And I, I brought with me a news clipping of our launch uh, review from the tech media in Silicon Valley. I guess not. <laughs> the headline was, Press Flip is a belly flop. Um, so that's a shot to the old confidence, I got to say. Um, and around the time that was happening, my wife was pregnant with our first baby. 
So we were running out of money, and the company was totally failing. So I did the most logical thing I could think of at the time, which was join another founding team of another startup, obviously. There were two guys working in an apartment in Palo Alto, and they were doing something in e-commerce. And I got hooked up with them through a friend of mine who worked at Facebook. Um, they didn't quite know what they were going to be doing yet, but it was like something in the e-commerce space. So I was like, okay, fine. They had already raised enough money that they could pay me for a year. Uh, and I figured, what the hell, it could be fun. Um, plus, it beats getting a real job. The three of us working together, we finally converged on this like local shopping idea. More and more brick and mortar stores were exposing this buy online, pick up in store feature to compete with Amazon. And to do that, they had to expose inventory data to the web. And we created Milo to aggregate all the inventory. And that's actually the picture that I have. So we'll show you where you can buy a bike in stock. It's actually on the shelf around you physically. Um, and we were really the first website to do that. So we'd raised about $5 million in venture capital through the, the company. Uh, and in 2010, eBay acquired us to become the eBay local group because this local inventory was starting to become a big thing. So that's the backstory. But what I really came to share today um, is something that I don't think is ever formally taught in a class. Uh, at least it wasn't in College of Science. Um, it's empathy. And in my opinion, it's the single most important skill that you can have as an entrepreneur. It's the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person. It's the ability to walk in their shoes for a minute. So all of you that put your hand up earlier about wanting to start a company, um, I'd like you all to think about the question of why you want to be an entrepreneur. Are you doing it because you want to change the world? Because you don't want to work for the man? Uh, or are you doing it because you want to make a lot of money? There's no right answer to this. Those are all good reasons to do it. Um, but think about that, and we'll circle back to that later on. So like I was saying, empathy is this ability to understand and share the feelings of another person. Developing a product is an uh, exercise in empathizing with your customer. Have you ever heard somebody give you this advice, solve a problem that you have? If you understand the needs of the customer, then you know when it's right. So solving a problem that you have, you're empathizing with yourself as the customer. That's the best test of whether or not you're going to, that this product is going to be a success if, if you're the one who is using it. If you like to use it, then that's a really good signal. But that's a lesson that I learned the hard way. Uh, when I was working on that first startup with my friends, I should have known that something was wrong when I wasn't really using our product like at all. Um, neither were any of our beta testers, the friends and family that we invited to come help us develop this thing. Uh, but I mean, it was a cool technical problem, like good challenge, there's gotta be some value there, right? Maybe, no. Um, it turns out that nobody really wanted to use an automated news recommendation system. Uh, we weren't meeting the user where they were. It was this catastrophic failure of empathy. All of the other news aggregators out there at the time were social, right? People submit the links and people vote on them and people comment them because this consumption of news is an inherently social exercise, and we completely missed that, like just straight over our heads. Uh, we were approaching it as a mathematical exercise, but that's not what it was. Um, and we could not step in the user's shoes. I mean, like pretty literally, because we weren't even using the product. Um, but with Milo, that was a bit different. Searching for products in stock around you, like that's a problem that I've had. Right? I need to buy something. I don't know where it is. Do I call around to the store? That's kind of a, like, why am I doing that? That's a waste of time. Um, but it's really funny how we had started like, chewing on this idea originally. It's, it's a, a really good point uh, to raise in how to empathize with your customer. Um, so Jack and John, my co-founders, uh, before I had joined them, they were working on this app to let people sell their used textbooks on Facebook. Right? I mean, fairly common story, I think. Um, but they invited some people back to the apartment in Palo Alto to look at it, to, to test it out. And 
I'm not sure how well that plays here in Rochester, but in Palo Alto, inviting somebody back to your apartment to beta test your startup is not at all creepy. It, it's totally fine. <laughs> uh, but one of the features that they had been experimenting with was surfacing inventory and pricing from Barnes & Noble, who had this uh, in-store pickup program so that the buyers could price compare the new book versus the used one. Sounds pretty interesting. Uh, but people like really latched onto that. They saw that, that like green dot, like yes, this is in stock like down the street. And because people really latched onto that, that's what became the product. And that happens a lot around Silicon Valley. Like you start one thing, you end up with something completely different and it's totally fine. Uh, when I had joined the, my two other co-founders, uh, they had just started taking this direction with the product and it was actually a really cool technical challenge. So I was like really sunk my teeth into it. Uh, and I found myself using it consistently. I didn't know it at the time, but that's how I n know now that I had successfully empathized with our customers, is that I was using it. I enjoyed using it, so I knew it solved the problem. But this became a common theme as we built our product, too. Uh, as an engineer, I was certainly more interested in the technical aspects of doing something like this. Um, Um, but Jack, our CEO, was a really top-notch product guy, and he got this concept of empathy that was just totally lost on me as a, you know, introverted mathematical engineer. Um, and I was more concerned with the technical correctness of the system rather than how well it suited the needs of the user. And I had the carcass of a startup to show for that. So my opinion in what was good for the user wasn't, like, worth a whole lot around the office. Uh, my point is, it has to be somebody's job in your company to empathize with your customer. And I don't mean that in like a touchy-feely, altruistic sort of way, like, is this good for the user? When one person is taking a hard-line customer point of view, then you can really expect some sparks to fly. Pride is going to get hurt. Um, but that pain is good for you. It's good for your company. Uh, don't ever be the customer and be afraid to say, this is total crap. Never be afraid to admit that. If that feeling is in your gut, then there's got to be something to it. And this was what was completely lost on me in the first startup. Once your company is beyond that prototype phase, which is a really nice way of saying you've raised some money and can afford to hire employees, your role in the company is gonna shift quite a bit. You're no longer a maker, but you're a manager. Uh, and in managing a team or working with people in general, that empathy thing, it's gonna come back as the single most important skill. The most effective managers I've ever known have had this like really uncanny ability to empathize with their colleagues. In the startup, this is critical because it's a high stress, high pressure, low resource environment, which is a fancy way of saying you're paying people very little money to put up with a lot of BS. And it's really easy to fall into this simple categorization in a business that there's good people and there's bad people. There's hardworking people and lazy people. There's leaders and there's detractors, right? And the leaders, we need to reward them, right? And they need to be elevated. And detractors, we have to punish them. We should fire those guys. Um, but I think this is an artifact of a really old way of organizing human society. And in my experience, when you categorize people as good or bad, as go-getters or as lazy, or as detractors or leaders, then that makes you a much less effective person when you're dealing with other people. You really have to understand where somebody is coming from when they're acting a certain way. When we were a startup, we hired this fantastic engineer. Like This guy was great. He was experienced. He could tackle complex problems. You put him on anything, he could get it done. Uh, but we noticed he was always really negative and just never approached things with a good outlook. And that sort of thing, especially in a small team, can really drag the rest of your team down. And even though he was a great problem solver, we'd considered firing him because he was making everybody else worse. Uh, his outlook to a problem was always, this solution is never gonna work because such and such reason. It was never, here's an interesting way we can attack this. So I kind of classified him as the bad guy, right? Like, he's dragging everybody down. I'm gonna fire this guy. Uh, but one night, I got to talking to him over a beer 
at this bar that was around the corner from our startup. Uh, and I kind of found out that through his work experience, he's become pretty bitter about never being able to go back and correct the mistakes that he's made. We call this technical debt. It's all of the shameful stuff that you do to ship your product on time. Uh, and you, I mean, to be honest, you never go back and do it the right way because you've already shipped it, the customers are buying it, why do we need to go back and address that again? Uh, but in software, this sort of thing, it builds up. It's, it's accretive. Um, and it makes life really hard for developers. And as a developer myself, I understood this pain. Uh, it feels like an indication that the management does not care about the developers, that they're just, hey, feature, ship it as fast as you can, right? Don't worry about that old stuff, that's all done. But as this complexity grows, shipping new features gets harder and harder. It takes more and more time. And your managers are always breathing down your neck. Why isn't it done? It should be done faster. You did the last one really fast. Why does this one take so long? Well, it's because I had to do the last one in two weeks and I couldn't do it the right way. And now I don't have time to go back and fix it. So everything else is slow. So I asked this guy, what is the technical debt you want to pay down here? And we talked for a bit about one of the subsystems and why it was causing problems for future development. Uh, and after talking about it, like I could really feel this guy. He was, he was not happy. And this was something that was really causing problems and was really making him negative. And I could especially feel it because the subsystem that he was talking about was something that I made. And I knew it was total crap. I knew it had to be redone. But I didn't want to admit that to myself. I don't know, call it pride, call it you know, wanting to ship stuff out the door, but there's a lot of times in entrepreneurship where you're gonna have to swallow your pride and really just face a fact. So I told him, okay, go fix it. If it's really that much of a problem, go do it. He was really taken aback. I said, yeah, I trust your judgment, so go do it. He spent a week and a half retooling this one part of the system, and he did a really good job, by the way. But after that, I could see a great positive change in attitude. He was much better to be around, much more, uh, good outlook. And that helped the rest of the team because he was a fairly senior engineer. This guy felt like he was in control of his own destiny after that, I think. Uh, and we'd gotten there because I was able to empathize with him. Um, this doesn't just work with employees, though. Very early on, uh, we were looking for ways to make our inventory checking code a lot faster because our servers had to call across the open internet to the merchant servers to do a stock check for an item. I mean, it's not a very interesting process, but it takes a long time because it's like traveling across the country. And that made our website really slow. So what we looked into doing was a pre-check of inventory levels once a day or so because we knew that they didn't refresh in real time and we could store this and serve it out of our own servers much faster. Um, but the difficulty in doing that is that these stock checks happen on a combination of a product identifier and a zip code. Um, and in the United States, there's roughly 48,000 zip codes. Uh, and if a merchant has 100,000 products that they stock like regularly on their shelves, which is not an unrealistic number, uh, that's 4.8 billion stock checks that have to happen in 24 hours. Um, but we managed to slim that down quite a bit with some clever math. So you really only had to check about 100 zip codes to get coverage for most of the country. Um, and given all that, 100,000 uh, products, 100 zip codes, it works out to about 115 queries per second to the merchant server, uh, which I don't know if that sounds like a lot, but it's, that's totally tractable for any like production web system. Uh, I mean, at least so we thought at the time. Uh, so I wrote this program uh, that we were gonna try on one of our merchants whose servers were pretty well behaved comparatively. Um, since we're on camera, I can't say who it was. Uh, but it's probably worth mentioning at this point that we never had permission to do any of this stuff uh, as a startup. We were a three-person team in an apartment. We couldn't go out and call up Best Buy and say, hey, can we have your inventory data? Because they would say, hey, no, and send us on our way. <laughs> so we just did it. We, we went out to the web, we figured out how to reverse engineer their systems, and we did it. Um, so, I mean, keep that in mind, that like, nobody ever told us we could do this. Um, we didn't have any contracts in place or anything. And we actually had to jump through a lot of hoops to make this look like it was just like regular web users calling their system because they would block this automated stuff. It was, it was a lot of fun. Like as an engineer, as you know, someone who's, I don't know, 
maybe a little nefarious. Like, yeah, that's a cool task. Uh, so I wrote this program in the morning, and I finished it at about 11 a.m. And it took me a little bit to get it sent out to a data center that had enough bandwidth to handle that kind of traffic uh, to run at full speed. Uh, so by the time I finished up, we were all hungry, and it was time to go to lunch. So the three of us, me and my two co-founders, we went out to lunch in Palo Alto. And maybe 30 minutes later, I'm like mid-sandwich, right? And our CEO, Jack, gets a call on his cell phone. And it's somebody from the data center where we lease our servers from. They say they had to shut us all down because of an abuse complaint from a remote network operator. And he gives me the eye. He's like, is that you? I'm like, yeah. So lunch over, time to go back to work. Uh, we get back there, and we find out that the information security people at this merchant that we were crawling, they thought it was a hack attempt. What had happened was they hadn't properly balanced the load in their subsystems. So while we were whacking on their website with our script, that was like sending all of this load to their production inventory database and totally overtook it, um, which meant that none of their retail point of sale systems across the entire country could make a sale for like 15 minutes. <laughs> um, oops. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, rightfully so, the, secu the security people freak out, right? Because they're, they're losing money. Uh, and they eventually trace it back to our data center and we get shut down. Uh, eventually we get on the phone with the security people at this company and they're like really in no mood to hear it, right? It's not having a good day. Uh, but this is where I saw something really masterful. Uh, our CEO, Jack, was able to connect with these guys on a different level. He was able to really understand where they were coming from. He apologized, of course, explained the situation, explained what it is we do, and how the point of our company was to send them more in-store sales. Now we're having a different conversation, right? It's not about you killed our servers, it's about we actually want to help you. And the security people, it's not their job to do this sort of thing, so they put us in contact with some business development people. And that's how we get a conversation started about a formal business relationship, by killing their stores for 15 minutes. <laughs> not that I would advise any of you to do that, of course. Like, that's a terrible idea. No. BizDev, yes. Everything's a BizDev. Um, but all it really took was this understanding of where these security people were coming from. Because we could have gotten into a fight with them, right? We could have gone tit for tat. We could have tried to evade their detection or move to another data center or do it slower. But that's not how you make progress. Their job is to keep the system running, obviously, but we'd found this empathy for them. Um, there's another little sort of important subnote to that story, which is that it is far easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. Um, we're not bad guys. We weren't malicious. We weren't trying to kill their servers. Uh, we succeeded when we sent them more business, and they got that. And I think when people understand your intentions, they're much more generous to you, especially if you're asking for forgiveness, which we did a lot. Um, that's not the only time something like that happened in our company history, but that's the most fun one. Uh, this type of human connection, this helps you raise money, too. The venture capitalists, I mean, yes, they are people, too, even though it doesn't seem like it sometimes. They're accountable to their limited partners. They have bosses like everybody else. They want to show a good return because they've gone out and they've raised money for their fund. Uh, entrepreneurs like to joke about VCs, so you have a founder and a VC who are walking down the street, and the founder spots a $20 bill on the sidewalk. He bends down to pick it up. The VC looks at him and says, whoa, what are you doing? The founder says, I'm picking up 20 bucks. And the VC says, no, it's a counterfeit. Don't do it. The founder says, how do you know? Because if it was real, somebody would have picked it up already. <laughs> I mean, there's some amount of reality to that. Uh, I mean, maybe a lot, but the investors, they spook easily. Right? Nobody wants to lose money, obviously. Uh, but the single most important thing that you need to raise money is not like a demo or a flashy product or like a portfolio of patents. At the early stage, the most important thing you need to raise money is this inner confidence. Because people who are investing, they generally invest in people over ideas at the early stage. Uh, and it's expected that your idea is going to change as you learn more about your market. 
They're not looking for your ability to execute on plan A. They're looking for your ability to get from plan A to the plan that works, hopefully before you run out of cash. For example, YouTube actually started as a dating site called TuneIn Hookup, seriously. Uh, when they invented this technology to play videos inside of a browser in a way that wasn't completely awful, incidentally, because they wanted people to have video profiles for their, their dating site profiles. But eventually they decided it was good for general purpose videos, so therefore, $1.65 billion later, Google owns YouTube. Um, but what Google doesn't own is OkCupid. Um, so you never know where your ideas are gonna take you, and it takes a lot of experimenting to find them. Um, but it really takes an inner confidence to execute on that, and that's what investors are gonna be looking for. Of course, you have to make a business case, right? You, you, need, to, you need all the graphs in your pitch that go up and to the right, right? Because that's what you wanna see. Bonus points for like the dotted line, right? You have like the solid line of like, here's all the users we have now, and the dotted line for the trend line in the future. Like, yes, of course that's going up and to the right. Um, you need to be able to speak their language, uh, stuff like CapEx and option pools, but you can learn all the language you need to know to like talk fluently about that stuff in a weekend with a, with a good business textbook. Um, and when you step into those investors' shoes, you wanna see that they trust the person that they're giving the money to. Um, they need to trust that you know what you're doing. In the pitch room, you get this like standard barrage of questions from an investor. Uh, my favorite one is, what if Google decides to do this, right? They can put 100 top engineers on it tomorrow. You're three people in an apartment, what can you do? Um, but a question like that, it's a trap. Don't ever answer that directly. Uh, there's no way to answer it directly to anybody's satisfaction. You have to like step around it cleverly. If you've ever noticed when a politician answers a question, um, it's like a really pointed question, they never actually answer it. They're just kind of like walking around it. Media trainers will teach you to step around questions like that by staying on message is what they call it, which is you go into an interview with a fixed message that you, you know, want to project to the world and every question is an opportunity to restate that message, right? So completely ignore what they asked you, say what you wanted to say. Like, I, that's how CNN works and that's kind of how investment pitches work. <laughs> so in the pitch room, your message is gonna be, I assembled this top team and we all know what we're doing. So when they ask you, what if Google does it? That's not a test, that's an opportunity. Restate your message. I'm not too worried about Google. They're a big company. They can't move as fast as we can. Google hasn't been able to keep up with small teams in the past, and we have the small team of experts in the field who are gonna tackle this problem, right? That's not tactical. That's just showing them that you have an awesome team. Not even showing them, it's telling them. But that's what the game is about. It's all about being confident, staying on message, and executing on your vision without really a care for whatever the competition is doing. But if you're feeling a little punchy to that question, like maybe you've done a few too many pitches and you're kind of at the end of your rope, uh, you can say something like, well, what if Google does it? Huh, that's why we like you as a value-added investor, because we'd really love to hear how you reacted when Google launched Google Ventures. Uh, but the pitch kind of like ends after that one. Never done that successfully. But incidentally, this actually happened to us. Uh, once Milo had gained some traction, Google got interested in this local inventory thing. Um, yeah, so this was the headline. Uh, Google cuts Milo at the knees with its blue dot specials. That's not good if you're raising money, man. You don't wanna see that in the media. That's terrible, right? So Google had surfaced this local inventory data, not from us. They were going out and getting it themselves. Um, I couldn't let that stand. TechCrunch, uh, had published one of my off-the-cuff Twitter statements about this launch, and I guess that's a harsh lesson in um, what happens when you state things publicly as they become public. So I said, and they, they put this in their article. I said, Google product search has availability for five retailers versus Milo's 49. Super cool web service, bro. Um, <laughs> now, and we decided to take this a step further. Uh, in retrospect, I'm still not positive that what I'm gonna show you guys is a good idea. 
uh, but it really seemed like it at the time. So our response was, we took this picture in front of our office of all of our team saying, cool story, bro, holding up our thumbs. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was my idea, and I, I talked our CEO into it, and he was like really hesitant, but I said, no, we can't let this aggression stand, man. We gotta do something about <laughs> it. Um, but I mean, that picture actually has some significance. Um, our office, where we're standing in front of here in Palo Alto, this was Google's first office when they like moved out of a garage. Uh, so here, you can kind of see like so we're on the left and there's Google on the right, right? So you know, kind of tongue in cheek. I'm, I'm hoping that the executives got it. I mean, maybe because not because they didn't acquire us, um, but whatever. <laughs> but then eight months later, we're here, right? So I mean, yeah, we threw some punches. Uh, and it was fun, but what it took was not running away and totally shifting directions because Google decided they were going to eat our lunch, right? We kept executing, and we were doing a lot better job than they were. We always had more retailers, more inventory than them. Um, even to this day, our, our local availability is better than Google's, and I think our technology works better because we did it a better way. I mean, not that I'm blowing my own horn here, but I don't like Google. <laughs> So, uh, all right, side note, um, selling a company, the most stressful thing I've ever been through, by far. We had to go through this diligence process, which is basically uh, eBay verifying that we were not a fraud before they bought our company. Um, it took months of like paperwork and lawyers, and it finally came to a head over two days in San Jose. Uh, they invited the deal team from our company, which was eight people, uh, down to this really swanky hotel in downtown San Jose um, for a, a like in-person diligence session where they were gonna ask us questions. And I thought this was gonna be easy because I'd already done all paperwork. So the eight of us are waiting in the lobby of this hotel. And the woman from eBay, who's the VP of corporate development, she comes out and she says, okay, we're ready for you now, and leads the eight of us back into one of these like event rooms at the hotel. Um, and he opens the door and there's like 40 people sitting around this U-shaped table versus eight of us, right? And like, oh my God, what is about to happen here? Like, no pressure or anything, right? <laughs> and I was on point for the technical part of this diligence. So here's me, like 26-year-old startup engineer in front of this team of like grizzled like eBay scale engineers who've seen some war, man. There were some scars in that room. Um, and I had to explain to them how our technology was going to be able to scale to two orders of magnitude more users, right? And like that's, that's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> um, but as, as I'm about to get up in front of the whiteboard, uh, Jack, our CEO, grabs my arm. He pulls me close. He looks me in the eye and he says, hey, don't screw up. <laughs> Um, but I guess I did all right. Uh, so, but in programming, that whole, that whole business story, that's what we call the happy path, right? That's where everything works out. There's no errors you have to account for. Uh, but that's not always the case. As an entrepreneur, um, you have to internalize that the default trajectory of a startup is failure. It's your job to like, keep it off that trajectory. Um, and Internalizing failure is not easy. It's, you have to be aware of this all the time, but you can't be afraid. That's the point. Um, it's really important to be able to empathize with yourself when things don't go right. Um, you're gonna make mistakes, sometimes catastrophic ones, right? That happened to me. Uh, in the beginning, I asked you guys to think about why you wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, money, independence, there's, like I said, there's no right answer to this. Um, but your answer to that question is going to determine how you internalize failure when it does happen. I'm not talking about the failure of your company. I mean, maybe, hopefully not. I'm talking about all of the failures that's gonna happen to you along the way. I've had a ton of them. My first startup failed miserably. I lost some really close personal friendships because of that, and it's really unfortunate. Um, and I think about it today, six years later, and I still wish 
I could have done some things differently. But what I don't have is any shame or guilt. And that's really important going forward. The way that you internalize this failure is going to determine your future success. So given that, I want to leave you with two stories. The first one, about a year after I joined eBay, I was getting the itch to do another project on my own. Uh, we would brought this eBay scale to Milo's inventory technology and surfaces stuff on eBay.com. So to me, that felt like the natural conclusion of that project. I really felt like I was done with it. I wanted to learn something completely new while I was at eBay. I wanted to launch an internal startup, which is something that the executives were really interested in. Um, and I thought it'd be cool. So this was around the time when Groupon was becoming a big deal. Uh, and I spent a lot of time looking at how Groupon worked and the economics of the situation. Um, and I spent a lot of time talking to the merchants who offered these Groupons. Um, and the economics are just totally out of whack. So I'd come up with a marketplace to bring these economics back into gear. Um, and everything looked good to, do, uh, good to go. I talked to the economists. It looked like it was going to work. And I put together a PowerPoint and went to the CTO of eBay to make my pitch. I said, here's the market. Here's the opportunity. I need a million dollars. Done. Easiest angel capital I've ever raised, although it wasn't like actually mine, right? It's the company's. Um, but for a year, my team and I worked on this project. We shipped the software, we hired sales staff, we had customers, and people were really using it. And our customers really told us they loved it. So everything's great, right? Um, we still weren't really getting meaningful traction. Uh, we were spending way too much money on sales. And the venture was never going to be profitable at that rate. So at the beginning, I had done what I would advise every entrepreneur to do, which is come up with a single number that quantifies your success, a single metric of success. And it's almost never revenue. Our metric was re-engagement rate, so the users that used our product once and then came back. Because if they use it once and they come back later on, sort of on their own accord, then you have value to them somehow. So we use that as a quantifier of our value proposition. Uh, and in software, you want that to be above 40%. If your re-engagement rate is above 40%, that doesn't mean you're going to make it. But if it's below 40%, you're probably not going to make it. Um, but we couldn't move that over 40%. It just wasn't doing it. So we shut the project down and moved on. Um, and I'd become an entrepreneur, entrepreneur because I wanted that kind of independence to work on my own projects. Uh, my goal was never really to make a lot of money. Um, so the internal start thing fit really well because you're never going to get rich like doing a startup inside of a company. Um, so I actually got what I wanted out of that project. I didn't feel too bad about the failure because I'd spent a year working on this cool thing and it was time to move on to the next thing. All right, second story. This is the better one. Like I said, I wasn't out for money, which it turns out was a good thing because a year or so after eBay acquired Milo, I made the single most expensive mistake of my career. Um, no, well, the single most expensive mistake of my career so far. Uh, and I brought it to show you today because I'm quite proud. Um, this is an email. Uh, you can see the subject and the sender, WhatsApp. Jan Kuhn is the CEO of WhatsApp. He says, my coworker says we should hire you. Um, and I went down to their office and I talked to them and they wanted to hire me. And this was in 2011. Um, and I think you guys know what's coming next. Let's see. Thanks for your offer, but I've got a bunch of interesting stuff queued up to tackle eBay for the time being. Um, and of course, three years later, Facebook acquires WhatsApp for $19 billion. Um, <laughs> the real kicker, though, is that Jan reached out to me every single year until that happened. So three times I said no. Um, yeah, that's yeah, expensive. Uh, a similar thing happened with uh, a different company. One of my co-founders, Jack, says, hey, there's this cool company in Palo Alto doing commerce. You want to go talk to them? They need some technical advice. Nah, I'm busy. That turned out to be Pinterest. Um, oops again. <laughs> But these sort of things can drive you nuts, right? Like, if you're out for money and you miss an opportunity like that, that's going to eat you up inside. But I'd never evaluated these through the lens of money. I'd evaluated these through the lens of, I want to work on something interesting. Join an established company that's already doing stuff? No, like, no, not interested. No thanks. Um, but that's what I want to leave you with. Uh, think about why you want to do this. There's no right answer and there's no wrong answer. Um, but when you're staring into the face of this seemingly impossible difficulty that you're going into, there certainly is a right and a wrong attitude. Thanks.
so I know we're out of time. I think we started late. Um, but if anybody has time, we can do questions. No? All right, yeah, question. So the question was, after eBay acquired Milo, uh, how do we integrate and what was my function? So I led technical teams to do this integration work. We had to pick up all of our software out of our data center and move it into eBay's data, data center and start porting to some of their platform. It took about a year to do that. You know, there's a lot of talk around, um, you learn it in Silicon Valley because they have an attitude of, uh, failing and failing fast. Mm -hmm. What can you tell the group about that kind of mindset for many people on the East Coast? Yeah, so the question is, in Silicon Valley, there's kind of an attitude of failing and failing fast. And what can I tell East Coasters about uh, that attitude? I'm actually from Connecticut, so I you know, understand where this comes from. Yeah. Um, the idea is, like I said, it's not, your, your objective as an entrepreneur is not to execute plan A. Right? It's to get from plan A to a plan that works. So you're looking at this business process not from I'm going in this direction. You're one level up from that. You're saying we're going to try this and we're going to see how that works and if not then we're going to try this. So the problem that you're actually solving is finding the thing that you should be solving. Question in the back. Uh, why did you want to be an entrepreneur? Why did I want to be an entrepreneur? The real reason is that I wanted to work on things I thought were interesting to me. Uh, people do it for all sorts of reasons. Some people want to make a lot of money. I think that's totally fine. Some people want to change the world. I think that's awesome. But for me, I was tired of being told what I had to work on. Thanks. <laughs> More questions? I mean. Yeah. The question was, how does it feel to go from being an engineer to being a manager? Um, it hurts. I I'm not going to lie. It's not easy, right? Because, I mean, we're at RIT, right? We're all technical people. You like to have your hands on the gear. And you like to think that you know how to do it, especially in software. You're like, no, you guys are idiots. We're going to do it this way, right? Um, but being a manager is all about cultivating trust. And that's, that's difficult for somebody who's been an engineer to do, especially if you're really familiar with the technicals. You have to be able to trust other people to do it for you. And you have to be able to offer them advice that's not going to look like an order. Um, and that's something that you really just have to practice. And I'm still not great at it. I'm still working on that skill. I think I always will be. Other questions? Okay. What's my advice to non-technical co-founders? Non co um, so I can speak from a software perspective to that. I would say, what you need to do is understand why programming is hard. Um, and if you have a solid product vision, being able to understand why programming is hard is going to let you build a software team that really respects your vision, if they can see that you're taking it in the right place and that you understand their plight. Did you marry an engineer? What are the kids like? And do you empathize with her? <laughs> Did I marry an engineer? What are the kids like? And do I empathize with her? Yes. So um, my wife is also an RIT grad. Uh, her name is Julia. She graduated in applied mathematics. And she worked as a mathematician for a number of years. Um, she was always better at calculus than I was and always will be. Uh, the kids are nice. Um, <laughs> They're five, three, and one, and yeah, and um, they are actually really into uh, like building blocks, like Legos and stuff. So I could not be more proud. <laughs> yeah. Advice for young entrepreneurs. Um, I would say find something that you really want to work on some problem that you think is worthwhile and work on it. Don't worry about what it takes to make money off of it. Um, 
but you have to be passionate about whatever it is that you do, or you're just going to get sick of it. Yeah? Should we assume if you leave eBay that it's going to be sold for about $100 billion? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I'm supposed to answer that one. I mean, right? Like, I, it, I don't is there anybody from the SEC here? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever wrestle with any fear? Did you feel fear of failure? Did I ever wrestle with any fear? Yes, every single day. Um. You know what it is? It's being able to introspect your own emotions, to understand why you're afraid of something, and to be able to reason about it. Fear is always a good motivator as long as you don't let it completely take you over. Um, and when you have a team, you really have to show that team your resolve as a leader. Um, and that's difficult to do. It's difficult to like grit your teeth and say, oh my god, Google just launched a competitor to us. Like, yeah. That's scary, but we just kept doing what we were doing. We kept our heads down on the problem that we were solving, and it ended up working out. Um, so it's difficult not to let fear paralyze you, and it's definitely a learned skill. Yeah. When you were initially putting together the, you know, the, the team of entrepreneurs, and, uh, obviously you have a, a level of expertise technically and, and I'm assuming the CEO, who, the person who was uh, the CEO, you know, is a great leader or a good leader. Oh, can you just go through quickly some of the dynamics of how you, as a team, got that initial mastermind group together? Yeah, sure. So the question is um, around how we got our initial team together. Um, our CEO was not technical. Um, so what are the dynamics surrounding that? So it was myself, uh, another technical co-founder, and our CEO. Our CEO, he went through this exercise of understanding why programming is hard. So it was very easy to, uh, he showed us a lot of respect for when we said this is difficult. Um, so he understood that when he was asking a lot. Um, the dynamics, I mean, sometimes I will admit it was not easy, right? You have three people in an apartment in a very high stress environment. Um, you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of resources, and nerves do get frayed. Um, but we really trusted that our CEO knew what he was doing. Um, and that trust came uh, empirically because he would go out and raise money. He was great at finding us talent and advisors. Um, and our roles inside the company all kind of fit with one another. So he set a great direction. Most of the time we agreed. Sometimes we didn't. When we didn't agree, we had a long discussion about it. Um, and sometimes when we said, like, look, this is going to require too much effort. This is too much time we have to spend on this one feature. And he believed us. He says, OK, we can move on. So it's this mutual trust of the founding team. And honestly, that's why a lot of founding teams break up, is because they lose that trust. In the back. Uh, I would, so the question is, how do you find the right trust in people, and how do you find the right people for your company? Um, I would turn that around and say, how do you know when you found a good friend? Um, somebody that you can actually trust with something. Uh, it, I mean, it's not always easy, right? It, interviews are, we did really extensive interviewing. We had a really interesting practice where when we wanted to extend somebody an offer to come work with us, we would hire them as a contractor for a week to come and do what we called a trial period to see how well they work with the team. And it, honestly, it was a two-way interview. They needed to see that they wanted to work well with us, too. Um, so as your company culture sort of solidifies, you have more people who are able to identify the type of people they want to work with. Uh, yeah. Another question that, um, The question is, did we run into any legal troubles for trusting somebody? Uh, fortunately, no. Um, we never had any problems with uh, employees or, or anybody that we trusted. There were a few people that we hired sort of mistakenly that we had to let go. Um, but it never really caused us any like legal or financial pain. Yep. 
how can a non-technical CEO get involved in a startup? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So as a CEO, if you are the CEO, you are the startup from day zero, right? So your job as a CEO, you have to keep money in the bank, you have to set the direction for the company, and you have to hire the talent to execute on the direction, right? So maybe you don't have your hands on it yourself, but you have to find the team and cultivate the team. This actually happened, the website dig.com back in the day, Kevin Rose, the founder, he hired someone off of Rent-A-Coder to start that thing, right? And, but he had this vision, and he's like, well, I have a little bit of money, so we can test this, right? Like, we, we can code this idea. And eventually, I mean, he obviously brought that person onto his team once it became a big thing, but I mean, that's what execution is. It's, it's building the team and delegating if you're not technical. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. Um, why did you go for a lot of money or like because you interesting because you wanted to help? It's like why? Yeah. So why did I co found Milo? Was it money? Was it interesting because I wanted to help? So I really don't like authority. Um, I don't being like told I don't like being told what to do. Uh, I mean, and even in the workplace. So I wanted to work on a project that I had significant ownership of, and also something that was interesting for me to work on. Um, I never went into it with the intention of, of making a lot of money. Uh, I mean, because if I had, I showed you that, you know, missing out on a $100 million payday, um, <laughs> that would have hurt a lot, but it didn't. Yep. Uh, what do you think Milo will be like in the future? What do I think Milo will be like in the future? Um, See, everything is going to be on here, for sure. I mean, this mobile was just getting off the ground when that was happening, but every everything is moving to mobile right now. Yeah. You you clearly indicated that empathy was important to you, and that's not one of the technical skills. How do you feel that RIT did in preparing you in that other area of your success? So my, the question is, how, how did RIT do in preparing me for the technical part of my success? Uh, very well in two ways. Uh, number one, the, the on-campus work I had here, just sort of by chance, was what got me you know, into Google and, and out to Silicon Valley. Um, and number two, like being in the mathematics program, uh, I mean, I never came up through CS, so I don't know what that curriculum was like. Yeah. Oh, the non-technical part. Ah, so, okay, the, the non-technical part of what RIT, RIT did to prepare me. Um, I would say being able to uh, work intensely in a small room that smells bad. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> so it's really important to know the type of people that you can uh, agree with in a professional capacity, right? And these are the types of people that become your friends uh, in class, right? The people you study with, the people you work with all the time. And that's a sort of skill that you, you learn inherently by being a student, because learning is never, it's never just you versus the class, especially at the higher levels. There are like teams of students. I remember in abstract algebra class, right? Like studying for that was a total team effort. And the test was like a take home that were eight questions that you had two weeks to do. Um, and obviously you're not allowed to work in teams on the test, but it really helped to be able to like bounce concepts off of one another and know the type of people who are willing to help you with that sort of thing. How do I balance being a manager role and also not liking authority? Wow, that's really introspective. So when I say I, I don't like authority, um, I mean I don't like authority that I don't trust. Uh, the P, I, I do a lot of work in uh, choosing the people that I want to work for. Um, and right now, I've, the people that I work for are people that I really trust. So I know that decisions that are made above my head, I believe in those decisions. And that's what's the most important part. Yeah. 
So for Milo, do we have just big corporations or do we have the mom and pop businesses? That was one of the earliest decisions we had to make as a startup. Um, we started off with the big companies because they were the ones who had the capacity to surface that inventory. And if you get Walmart, then you have every state in the country worth of coverage. So our strategy was to get the big companies, the big box, the Walmart, you know, Best Buy, Target. And then once you have that user traction, then you can go start selling to the mom and pops. But that's a much harder sell. It's very capital intensive because they don't have the IT infrastructure to do that. They're just now starting to be able to do it. Um, so there are a couple of ways. I mean, that, the answer to that question has changed. But the way it is now is we have an app. It's, it's an eBay app uh, that integrates with some point of sale systems that are commonly used at small stores. Yeah, go ahead. So throughout my career, what was my biggest challenge in being a successful entrepreneur? Um, my most challenging thing in the whole career was managing the work-life balance. Um, because like I said, I joined Milo when I had one kid. My, my daughter was born. And now I have three. And um, it's really worth it to spend the time thinking about what makes you happy in life. Um, some people, work is what makes them happy, uh, but not me. Um, I, I like to spend time with my family. I like to go camping totally off the grid where my cell phone doesn't work. Um, and that's the sort of thing that I need. So being able to manage that is really important. Thanks. Oh, wow. Wait for the time. I would like to thank Ted for making the long trip from California to speak to this group and be the keynote of our speaker. And we'd like to give you this small, very small, token of our appreciation and thanks. Thank you. A couple logistical issues. There's been some uh, changes in the next session. The, um, the ABC Shark Tank um, event will actually be here in Ingle, and the exploring customer discovery process, which is a review of, um, of NSF's i is going to be in the bamboo room, which is upstairs, and there'll be people outside uh, if, if you need information about where to go. Thank you very much.